Saludos amigos, tripulantes, crew member of our beloved, polluted and unique spacecraft, which, since the last time we met, has taken another turn about its imaginary axis and of course continues creating events in full development. And there are some events and they keep on happening, for example in the Middle East, the news today is that Israel continues bombing and bombing and bombing and whatever may happen, here there is something that is always ensured, the Security Council of the United Nations, whether there's a sanction, the United States, as they have the veto, together with other powers of World War II, will be saving Netanyahu who continues with his way of thinking. Here, the actual hero was his brother who died, but now Netanyahu wants to become the commander in combat. And it becomes monotonous, but if you're there, it's dramatic. Let's take a look at the events in full development. And this brings us towards a sad reality of what's happening, regardless of all United Nations resolutions. This is Mr. Netanyahu, who is supported by the United States lobby. Israel bombing the armies supported by Iran in Syria, Netanyahu arriving at the conference of the security forum. Upon concluding, Netanyahu said, the Shiites should understand that Syria is 96% sunny. So when they bring 88,000 Shiites, their objective is not to implement Israel only, their objective is to turn the Sunnis. This is a recipe for the recreation of another civil war, and this is a theological, a religious war. The sparks of this could be way more that could go to Europe, and this is what could happen in any other place. This would lead to problems and terrorism in many countries, and by impeding these, we have bombed bases here of these Shiite armies, and we're also offering and providing aid to the security of their countries and the security of the whole world. And he says that while smiling. So this is a picture with Christian Nielsen, Secretary of Security, a felon picture, you'd say. Israel once again has attacked the Shiite militia, and the Prime Minister provided the statement they already showed. This is a recipe for another civil war, a theological or religious war. But take a look at the once beautiful cities of the Middle East. The main forces and the Haftar of Libya mentioned they are about to take control in the east side. Saleh Arach of the Libyan army mentioned here there is nothing left everything that was left of them around 50 or 60 remnants and the east and west of Shila have been recovered the remnants are hitting in their last fortress in the central region therefore they're protecting them from vehicles and fighting with the snipers as they did with the Sabri district in Benghazi Officer of the army driving a special car for combat. We've been absent for five days. A local resident, Majula Perganivi, mentioning I wasn't here for five days. I went after the explosion of a bomb here. We were forced to leave and we are just back. That's my truck. But we haven't yet seen the damage. Hopefully everything will be all right. We hope that this will happen. In front of the local market, Natural absence of life. A man around there decides to walk, risking his life, and Mohammed al Diafituri in this small market provided his statement as well. People continue with the life 
as long as possible. The reporter asked him, well, what's happening with the stores? And he said, look, take a look at this. This is a ghost town. Some families have come back, particularly after the liberation of call of the army for families to come back. However, not all of them have come back. Maybe two or three families returned, that's it. And the stores, well, the stores are closed because there's lack of money and there's lack of food and energy. Well, we do have energy, but in some areas we don't have any because some of the distribution panels were affected. And this hasn't been solved yet, and there's no one around this to try and solve this. We haven't seen any technology. We don't have water either because the main plant has been closed because they're afraid to be bombed and they're afraid of explosions as well. This is the outside of the plant to treat salty water. Residents then filling these tanks in the pickup truck they're bringing and bring also some empty bottles to see if they can also fill them. That's the only way where they can get water to their houses. This is not a situation you would like to be in. And of course, the whole world is under trauma due to last attacks. After taking Darna, this would complete all the taking of the East according to the Libyan army. The foreign affairs ministers of Japan, United States and South Korea were meeting. This is a still a take from the hospitals in the areas attacked by Israel. A soldier who is safe, apparently. And in the meantime, the ministers that I mentioned previously meet in Seoul, South Korea. The Minister of Affairs, Kwon yun Wa of South Korea, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo of the USA, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Taro Kono of Japan, taking pictures in the room. They usually call this a family picture. Pompeo's delegation take a seat at the meeting, all the different ministers are there, Pompeo walking down the room, people shaking hands, some PR there, and Khan sitting at the meeting and Secretary Mike Pompeo with Kwan Yong Hua from South Korea and the Chancellor of Japan, Karakono. And the meeting of three parties that took place in Seoul on July 14th that is clearly a heavyweight. Three diplomats will analyze the results of the summit between Trump and Kim Jong-un because the meeting will be followed by a press conference. There is a lot of things to say about this, but people aren't calm about this matter. China supports dialogue to peacefully solve the nuclear problem of the Korean Peninsula. The Council of State of China and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Wang Ji, shaking the hand of Mike Pompeo, as we saw before, and one provided his statement two days after the President of the State, Donald Trump, and the President of Korea, Kim Jong-un, had a historic summit in Singapore and they started an agreement. This was the beginning for a peaceful solution on the problem of the peninsula, and both parties are expected, both the United States and the Papua Democratic uh, country of Korea will reach an agreement with the summit. Pompeo there and China supports dialogue related to the nuclear part of the Korean Peninsula for a peaceful arrangement. And Pompeo, who visited Beijing hours before this three-part meeting, mentioned that, that well, that's parallel 38. There, everyone is always at the expectation and they don't even move. Well, when you're there, you will understand what this means. That's South Korea. There is a division that even showed the line of negotiation. This is dramatic. Everyone quiet and the guards are looking at each other. North Korea and South Korea, as if they were about to start shooting. Tensions can be felt there. But this is an inherited reality, however it seems to warm up. Soldiers of the Korean Republic, people to study South, this is North Korea, of course. The Popular Republic of Korea, 
and the Democratic Republic of Korea start military conversations with generals in Panmunjong in order to alleviate military tension between the parties, the Panmunjong infamous city. And about this, there are some very interesting initiatives that are said to come together. Pin, Putin invites Kim Jong-un to visit Russia in September. Kim Jong-nam walking towards a meeting with Putin and Kim mentioned, Dear President, dear friends, I am very happy to see you here today. He always uh, makes a whole for translation, always professional. Thank you for accepting our invitation and today come to Russia. You know that we have always tried to solve the problems in the Korean Peninsula. And in regards to this, I would like to emphasize that, of course, we welcome the contacts that have started between the leaders of North Korea and South Korea. And then he mentioned. We also welcome and appreciate the results of the meeting between the leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, and the President of the United States, Donald Trump, that recently took place on June 12th. This is, in fact, just the first step on the way for the complete agreement, then another hold for translation. But due to goodwill of both leaders, this step was taken. Of course, this creates conditions for a better progress and decreases tensions in the Korean Peninsula. <laughs> Members of the delegation of North Korea listening to these and taking some notes, regardless of this being recorded. And President Putin said, after this meeting, we are far away from a desirable condition and then peaceful conditions and diplomatic and political events could be the best ones. So he's speaking about a war, however, he's using a euphemism. I would like to confirm and I would like you to give this to leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, our invitation for him to visit Russia. This could take place in Vladivostok in September during the economic forum. Well, this is the high management of North Korea and Kim Jong-nam mentioned. It's my honor to greet you on behalf of Kim Jong-un, the Supreme Leader of North Korea. And then he added, it's also a great honor for me to give you a private message from the leader of North Korea. Kim Jong-un of North Korea said, Dear Mr. President, please accept our congratulations for the next great event, the opening of FIFA's World Cup. We hope that this event would become an important moment in order to show the greatness of Russia to the rest of the world and also improve the economy and development of sports. Of course, this was before the opening game of the World Cup. Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong 
This meeting took place in the Kremlin on June 14th after an invitation was sent to Kim Jong-un to visit Korea. Kim Jong-nam is the manager of the Presidium of North Korea and the invitation to Kim Jong-un takes place after a couple of days after the leader held historic meetings in Singapore with the President of the United States, Donald Trump. Putin welcomed the meeting between the North Korean leader and President Trump and during the meeting the message that was sent to Putin was provided. So this is how things are going in the Far East. There are countries that support the sanctions against the United States due to the increase in tariffs. And here, still is also at stake, as well as aluminum. The plan that was supported by the countries of the bloc are going to impose tariffs for 2.2 billion euros, around 3.3 billion dollars, as a response to the tariffs that the United States set on tariffs and aluminum. After the acceptance of the European countries, this will be applicable facing the Community of Europe Executive. Bolivia and Russia will widen bilateral cooperation and military cooperation as well. Bolivia and Russia look for the possibility of expanding the cooperation technically and militarily in the bilateral meeting held with the brother of Evo Morales in Moscow. They want the possibility to expand the technical and military cooperation added by Vladimir Putin. President Morales said that he wants to industrialize Bolivian lithium and the bioceanic train project. Chamber of Congress approves the law project to depenalize abortion in Argentina. Now, the law project for legalization of abortion will be a matter for the Senate. After a session lasted for 20 hours, the Chamber approved the law project for voluntary interruption of pregnancy with 129 votes in favor, 125 in against this. So this shows the how close they were. So this document contemplates the voluntary interruption of pregnancy up to the 14th week of pregnancy. Nicaragua is the still news and not the best ones. They will continue with dialogue on Friday to stop political violence. The government of President Nino Ortega and members of civil society on Friday will start dialogue mediated by the Catholic Church to stop the wave of violence and politics by the right wing of the country that had led to at least 147 killed. Who are we remembering now? Today, it's 90 years after the birth of Che Guevara. Let us remember a part of his fight defending oppressed peoples. Born on June 14, 1928, in Rosario, Argentina, son of Ernesto Guevara and Seria de la Cerda, El Che decided to choose a different path to what most could have imagined provided his economic position. He could have been a lawyer, but he was interested in medicine and politics. The Civil War of Spain set him in contact with the social reality of the world, and for 500 miles or kilometers of right in Argentina showed him inequality. Medicine was the bridge for his destination, which was creating a revolution to gather a social change in all Latin America. But he was a journalist during his whole life, even during his days in Sierra Maestra in Cuba. He loved literature and poetry, and as a journalist for different news agencies, he was always willing to show his reality, not only politically, but also with sports and culture. All the great figures of the world went by and he offered his charisma. And I have a personal anecdote about this. Maybe it's the time to share this with you. I was no longer in the Air Force and Che Guevara was in Montevideo for a conference that was going to take place in Punta del Este. 
I was the delegate of the left Christian wing that were the first ones who created Frente Amplio, the Christians. Some comrades laughed at us. But they still have a government, the third one of Frente Amplio. And now I remember our leader, Juan Pablo Terra, didn't have a lot of charisma. He was quite dull, but he was very clear with his ideology as the left wing Christian and the secretary of the Communist Party of Uruguay when we met with him as a left wing Christians because we decided that we had to agree if we wanted to make a change, and then we created this white front. I will not say the names, of course. And he said. Frente Amplio, but with whom? With Juan Pablo Terre and four other guys that don't matter like you? Well, this is Frente Amplio, their third government, and looking for the fourth one. Now, here we must remember I took place. I had to walk 144 kilometers on foot to support him, and the planet was waiting for the events that were going to take place in Punta Leste. So I had a huge American truck, but I was bringing only sandwiches and water for the people walking with me. And I mentioned, I'm a delegate for medicine, I have the right to come in. But listen to this, I will take up my scraps, I'll park this and then go in. And when I was going to get in, Americans weren't very happy with this march in Punta Leste, and they requested to stop it. So they stopped this, and when I was to get in, to speak with Che, they decided that I couldn't come. It's blocked from this line. And my teammate, who was ahead of me, spent four or five hours taking or drinking mate with Che. Well, he also had to take the route and go through Bolivia, including the place where there is a body and there's not even a single space where we can write names and dates in the Euro Gorge. It's very difficult to go through this space when you are bringing your equipment with you. All of us who have been part of the Army know how much this weights. Now I'm Porque going to speak de about de the Navy, Navy because the Bolivarian Army, for dossier, have sent a statement about the third training ship, Velas Latinoamericanas, 2018, Wednesday, June 14, 2018, operational activities. Simón Bolívar Bravo Econce for the third training ship, Velas Latinoamericanas, is currently sailing in latitude 50 south. It should have varied by now. So 50. 30, 40, 50. So they are here. Y, and uh, we we'll reach the port of Callao in Peru on the 17th of June 2018. Callao is a very important port. This will be a beautiful experience for them, of course. Everything related to Peru is beautiful. It's mentioned they continue with the academic activities for the cadets, training about Navy crafts, maneuvers, calculations, and fulfilling with the study plan Simon Bolivar. Climate conditions, cloudiness, no precipitations, went up to 16 knots and up to 20 knots, and waves up to 1.6 meters. Good visibility and today's Navy glossary, we have the word orinque. So we're speaking about a big knot that on the end is tied to the cross of an anchor and on the other side is added to a buoy. So we know the anchor, it has some hooks and then there's a cross. This one is called the cross of the ankle. So then you use the boyarin, so whenever they set the anchor, they know that there's going to be a wire linked to uh, a boat, and the boy is used there to understand where this is located at the bottom of the sea.
Bueno, eso es el Orinque. El ok, so es this is Orinque. Rodríguez Hernández, capitán de fragata. Rodríguez Hernández, de captain, de mando de la Armada, Antonio officer Ponte, and Antonio Mejía Ponte, control operacional, como director, ship captain and Marco director, Arandia, and Marco Fachel Arande, commander in chief of the Bolivarian bueno, Army. Buen viento y buena mar. So good Bravo luck. Conce. Bravo de Conce. Tenemos el, el nuevo modelo de exquisita this escala. This is our new model. Beautiful with the eight stars. <laughs> Como la, vean, ahí lo tienen, in the flag, so you can see it. Para los muy because those la, who were observing this closely, the model that I had no for many years caso. didn't have Ahora eight stars, it only had seven. Diferentes. Now si everyone no, is happy. Because if de, not, we will fall into a court of the Inquisition bueno, of History. Ver, no veo en los monitores nada so que my que screens tenemos, don't show si fuera, anything more important than the news that we have provided, so we're going to continue a short break and we'll be back with more events in full development. Muevan, Stay where you are, we'll be right back. We are back with more events in full development. Esto me trae a la memoria. Voy a tener que hacer una solicitud. I will have to make a request because this is urgent. We request the following medicine urgently. Rapamune. 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 Sirolimus. Or Sirolimus. 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 Whoever has this medicine, please. Call the number 0058 Or also at email Vladimir, Vladimir ADR, everything in lowercase, Vladimir DR at gmail.com. This reminds me of the time where we had an action for Carla, a young girl, and this was a very important case, a very saddening one, however, but the response was so important, we created the Carla Foundation after that. But here, things are difficult because we're facing an asymmetric war that also includes taking the medicine away from us. They, they did the same against Allende. They were the first things they disappeared and understand where this all started. Pets, toilet paper, y then ahí, food, ahí, then medicine, el, el and there is a guideline for a coup d'etat, supported by a trade national company, ITT, and of course the right wing of Chile. Bueno, el de Liberación Nacional, okay, the National Liberation Army, the dialogue with the National Liberation Army started in February 2017 in Quito. Pero en mayo, esos but in May, the dialogue has stopped happening in Ecuador and were set to Cuba after Moreno, President of Ecuador, Lenin Moreno, decided to exclude the territory of his country from negotiations. It's weird what comes from Lenin. You were so progressive. Uh, we went to Panecillo. You invited me home. But you may have your reasons, right? La Habana recibe a la and once again, Havana welcomes Colombian delegation because peace dialogues between FARC and the Colombian government took place for four years. We were part of those dialogues. We couldn't publish what we saw, but we can remember this moment as uh, a reminder we were able to do something. Havana will welcome the delegations of Colombia because for four years the dialogues between the Colombian government and FARC took place. They created the peace agreement signed in Bogota on 2016, November 24th. We're going to show a video of May 10th, 2018, coming from Span TV. This is not 
our video, but we are going to show delegations of the Colombian government and National Liberation Army started in Havana, Cuba, the fifth cycle of peace cooperation in order to stop a ceasefire temporarily. We were previously in Havana there, witnessing this from a journalistic point of view. Let's take a look at even the event right now, because this is another fight that just cannot stop. It is very interesting to see what's happened there. These are the talks in Cuba in a joint statement. The ELN and Juan Manuel Santos stated that during the next four days they're going to continue with dynamism the agenda to achieve concrete results. The manager of the government regulation, Gustavo Bell, wants to comply with the expectations of the Colombian people. This is a process that has already started being dynamic and keep a pace that forecast with certain optimism that we can have concrete and favorable results at midterm that will foster us ahead so that we can eventually reach a given moment where the Colombian society will be the one requesting and continuing with the dialogues regardless of the government chosen. Pablo Beltrán, part of negotiators of the militia, mentioned that after the satisfactory experience of 101 days of ceasefire that were established by the party's previous hand, have now spoken about a new moment. The only viable way for Colombia for a political solution is that the dialogue will continue. No adversity will allow us to leave this table. Bell mentioned that one of the objectives of this table is to get rid of the violence in the conflict. However, in Colombia, we are facing a situation, as was mentioned by Ambassador Mora, very difficult. Belen Beltran thanked Cuba for welcoming both delegations new cycle conversations after the president of Ecuador lending money informed in April his decision to stop being the headquarters of dialogues and the guarantor. Getting a peace in Colombia is a historic need for the whole of Latin America and the world. So we accepted once again the responsibility of accepting to host the peace agreement of Colombia in this particular case, the fifth cycle of this dialogue. During four years, Cuba welcomed the representatives of the former FARC and the executive power in a process that concluded on November 2016 by signing a peace agreement that is currently being implemented. Well, events continue in full development, and our beloved, polluted, and unique spacecraft continues turning about its imaginary acts and, of course, creating events in full development. Today, Thursday, 14, 2018, from Vanguardia.com, Chancellor Maria Angela Holguín and Senator Roy Barreras became part of the dialogue table with ELN in Havana. We were there before, sharing this experience with them that has sadly not stopped. The objective of President Santos is to reach an agreement with the militia before the end of his mandate. Huh, now he wants it. Before August 7, Maria Angela Chancellor, Senator Roy Barreras, and the Council of the President José Rios, and the High Commissioner of Peace, Rodrigo Rivera, are a part of the negotiating team for peace of the former Vice President Gustavo Bell negotiated with the guerrilla of the National Liberation Army. And the National Liberation Army is a political military organization and militia that was born before FARC on July 4, 1974. And ever since, with FARC, there has been news and more news that have shown the events in the unique polluted spacecraft where we live in, and their struggle was to take over power, and it was not self-defense, as mentioned by the FARC. So it's an important difference in concept. They have been very radical, and their ideology 
also mixes with Marxism and Christianism, particularly the theology of liberation, the one that was so difficult for Christians that defended it. Many priests and nuns have participated and will continue participating. One of the most important commanders were priest Manuel Perez and also Camilo Torres, who died in combat. I had the chance to meet his mother in Uruguay. For some years, contacts have started with the negotiation between this guerrilla and the Colombian government, and since the beginning, it was demonstrated that they were going to be different even in the place, Quito. So, they divided because they, they wanted to show that they were continuing the one from the other. They took place there, and until some weeks ago, President Lenin Moreno ordered them to leave the country. I had a chance to meet Lenin Moreno. He wasn't president yet, and this decision is weird, but he has all his sovereign right and also his reasons, I figure. And as it often happens, Cuba hosted them. This is mentioned by one of the most important responsible people of this, Commander Pablo Beltran, who has been in front of this negotiation since the beginning of them. Fernando Calvo Espina, writer and journalist based in France, met with him in Havana and spoke about this. There has been a selection of the most important topics that I would like to share with you. As, for example, the reason for negotiation, the financing of the guerrilla, their position on the Bolivarian process of Venezuela, and in exclusive for those who would like to share with you, this, which is a historic event. Take a look and let's share this moment. Well, as we said, Let's listen to the protagonist telling us the story. So there are some conversations with a different delegation sent by the government of Bogota. We are finishing the fifth cycle of this conversations and our idea is to sign a peace agreement based on an agenda that has been agreed for a couple of years already. And for the immediate term, we are working to agree a bilateral ceasefire at the short term. But the agenda on point one states that we need to involve the society when seeking for peace. So the ceasefire is to thrive and improve the participation of the society so that they're not only an inactive a spectator looking for peace. That's the purpose of ceasefire. Why are you here in, in Cuba? You are in Quito today. Well, because President Moreno, out of nowhere, said that he was no longer going to host the talks. So we spoke to the government of Cuba, and they always willing to promote the peace of Colombia, said yes. These are the times where I have realized that the United States are back to Ecuador. Isn't there a coincidence behind this? Of course there is. The Ecuadorian government, in particular the president, said that we were related to the problems in the border between Ecuador and Colombia. And even children in Ecuador know that this isn't true. But he brought up this excuse and mentioned we are no longer the host for dialogues here in Ecuador. And, well, we respect the sovereignty of this government, of these people, and we said, okay, that's where I will find another place. What do you expect of this dialogue? Is this a dialogue, an approach? This is an agenda for conversations for the peace of Colombia between the government of Bogotá and the ELN. That's what it is. And you're speaking with the Colombian government after what's happened with FARC, where the promises have been fulfilled? You're right. But it's not a good reason. Why? Okay, the promises made to FARC aren't complied. The negotiation model with FARC is leading to the disappearance of FARC as a military force and as a political force, so it's completely being blown away. So we take notes and learn from this. But even though we are not discouraged by this big problem or to look for the peace in Colombia because 
Both you and I know that the only way, the only feasible path so that the society can progress is peace. So if this is the path, then we need to work for it. For example, three years ago, everyone was telling us, do what you have to do with FARC. And now they tell us, follow the path of FARC, but don't do the same mistakes. They gave everything they had and believed that the regime was going to comply. But at the end of the day, the implementation is not done like that. An implementation is, you do this, I do this. If you don't do it, I won't do it. So they stopped following this mechanism. I reckon that they did not go up to speed. They accelerated negotiations in order to be able to participate in the elections. But the purpose of peace goes beyond elections. So they gambled for something that had a terrible result at the end because they went uh, to the elections and the political result wasn't good. The struggles for war and peace are made without principles, and if something clearly defines the ELN is that it has principles. We are flexible in order to see how we progress towards the objectives. We want socialism in Colombia. To achieve changes in Colombia, a revolution is needed. But we don't lose our colors, and we also want to negotiate. We believe that negotiated solutions can be achieved, and then we're trying this. Where does the money come from? In every area where we are, all the economic activities developed in those areas get the benefits of the conditions of tranquility and calmness in those areas. You know that security is a public service. So the majority acknowledge us, they acknowledge the stability of this area, and they give us some voluntary tax. All the companies that arrive there must pay tax. And every company, what do, you, what do you mean by this tax? And every company gives them 10% of the profit for security costs. So they know about this. So this tax is respecting their productive activities. What is demand of them? To respect labor laws. Respect communities. It's mutual respect. So we're in against for an investment. If you respect the communities, the environment, the agreements, then it could happen. This isn't part of capitalism, because you advocate for socialism, don't you? Colombia follows an economic model called agroextractivism. We are widely present in San Lucas, it's the biggest gold reserve of Colombia. You have two ways out. You either allow the communities to exploit gold and work with them to minimize environmental damage, or you open the doors to the biggest mining company of the world. So what do we do? How, what about you and drug trafficking? Well, Colombia has over 100,000 hectares of coca. 100,000, yeah. This means that when in 1990 it was decided the neoliberal economy was the one required, then the farmers economy were no longer profitable so then colombia starts importing for instance cassava from indonesia we're importing coffee we're importing rice why this is neoliberalism if cassava of indonesia is cheaper in Cartagena, it is because it comes from Indonesia. So this broke the economy of the farmers. So what do the farmers have to do? Well, coca. So what's the amount they earned with coca? Maximum 3% of the total the chain. So where's the other 97 in the mafias of their estates? Who is penalized? Well, 
the most steep one Entonces, usually. So what do we tell the government? Let's agree with the communities with programs for voluntary substitution of crops and let's stop the fumigation because you use glyphosate, then you will be gone with everything, people, environment, water. So there are some plans for substitution of crops. Even part of the agenda discussed by the FARC, there is a plan for substitution that happens voluntarily. Do you think they care about this? They don't. What do we do? We tell the government, respect the substitution plans that these organizations have. Comply with this. That's it. That's what the government is for, for the people. One kilo of coca paste, so this is just the base paste, adds up to a thousand dollars today. One kilo of cassava costs 20 cents, so the difference is massive, 20 cents for one kilo of cassava, 2,000 a kilo of coca. So the money left for the farmer is an all for him because they have to pay for their people, they have to think about the erosion, have to pay for transportation, they have to pay for manure and other things. So based on our economic studies, it is shown that with a lot of effort, farmers break even with the price they have. They don't get rich. If they are mindful, they will save some money. But the economy of coca creates a culture, a culture of easily becoming wealthy, so you tend to waste your money instead of saving it. So if you take a look at these areas, they don't have absolutely no progress. The group of the incomes of ELN, most of them are in taxes for the production of coca. We don't penalize the farmers. No. We charge the one who goes from outside to buy coca. They are the ones paying for this tax. Have you said something? about the Chavism. In Colombia, the matrix continue happening, the ones that were created in the Pentagon. So Uribe started speaking about the Castro Chavismo when the Pentagon created the script. In the speech called Sermon that takes place on Holy Friday that is very important in the most important church of Colombia, Bogota, Cardinal Salazar said a very important truth. He said, Castro Chavismo is the way of making people afraid and politics when carried out with fear, then this is not what should be done. So if you listen the main current of Colombia telling the truth, then this is very important. Well, due to the support of Venezuela, the dialogue process and peace process started with FARC and due to Venezuela. Thanks to Venezuela, this process kickstarted, and Venezuela still has, uh, is still a guarantor of this round of negotiations. So Venezuela is gambling for the peace of Colombia because they follow a logic. Colombia's peace, once achieved and consolidated, the first level of impact would be Colombia, then the neighboring countries, and the third one is the whole continent. Peoples have the right to decide the destination they follow and the rest have the duty to respect this self-determination. We have mentioned this to Santos every day. Let them be. They have problems. What society doesn't have problems? What do we have to say then? Well, solve them peacefully and solve them. What are we supporting? What they were saying in their majority. What would happen if tomorrow there's an invasion in Venezuela? We have 
a hypothesis of 10 or 20 years ago. As long as the state is interrupted from other places of the world, they will be trenched in Latin America and the Caribbean. What are they doing today? They're doing this. If you take a look at the global worlds, the Middle East, North Africa, and the rest of the East, they are going back. So Latin America and the Caribbean are becoming the new targets. The invasion. Many speak about the invasion of Venezuela as a future fact, but this is not true. The invasion to Venezuela is already here. Let me tell you why. We are throughout the 1,200 kilometers of border and we have front between Colombia and Venezuela. What can we see there? A process of permanent aggression with military, with undercover the actions, with militia, by promoting all types of traffic, promoting corruption on the inside of Venezuela. So there is a state of aggression. It's a latent one, it's an ascending one. The last two congresses that we held where we speak about our policies have said the following. The ELN is fully willing to tackle away any aggression of the Venezuelan people and the revolution. The aggression is not future, it's a permanent one. But we are also willing to respond to this from the Colombian side. We will continue demonstrating that if we're actually trying to solve this politically and we're looking for peace, then why do we need 500,000 soldiers? Why do we need a war budget? Why do we need to be part of NATO? This is the logic, this is common sense. We've been in NATO for 15 days. Yes, but this is not because Santos just said this when he left power. We're not happy, nor is the society. This is just a starting. I don't know. I don't know. Thank you very much. Well, a lot of truths said, the ones that we need and learn from them, extrapolate them, as long as our beloved, polluted and unique spacecraft takes another turn about its imaginary axis. And we'll be here tomorrow to tell you the story of the next 24 hours. Sharing as often from the Studio 3 of Venezuela Televisión, the official network of Venezuela, the air of TVN5 of Charneca, where we started in 1971. And well, back then, it was all different. Everyone was sitting there in a desk, and then we decided that the floor was also necessary. The desk will be there only when we need. We need to move, we need to interact, and we need a map, because how can we locate geographically an event that is taking place elsewhere? And of course, be reminded of this, this is what we need to repeat all the time. This, the Persian Gulf, if there is a problem with a vessel, 40-48% of the oil in the world will not be able to reach the states. And we need to set this in stone. The Atlantic Ocean, then you must go upwards, the Atlantic, and then somehow come to the Caribbean and reach the refineries in Texas. In the best of situations, it will take you 40 or 45 days sailing. Let us be reminded that also transporting oil is a great business. In the meantime, ourselves, we who have the greatest research in the world together with also rare minerals and biodiversity and water, those of us who have been in a war in the desert know how much water is worth. I have been twice in Sahara, 4,000 kilometers, never forget about this. But the war of the future might be due to water, let's hope that this will not be the case. And those 45 days sailing, this will become four or five days depending on the conditions. And it is weird that if we are reluctant 
to comply to the orders of Trump in the White House and what others are willing to do so in Colombia. Then now they're looking for a way to intervene, execute and change everything that is happening here. Well, you are the ones who should decide this. But now this is so obvious as the treason of the Colombian leaders is. However, here there's no resentment. But explain why five and a half Colombians live here and not in Colombia. Almost six million because there's free education because they have all the possibilities for their children to study and reach a higher level, free health and education. And regardless, today, they bring things to take there. If this wouldn't be dramatic, it would be funny. But let's just stop there. We will we'll be back tomorrow after our beloved Pelut and Unique Space Graham had taken another turn about its imaginary axis. And we'll be back here to tell you the story of the next 24 hours. Please don't say anything to Telesur. This is not a Telesur show. If you want to communicate with us, send your messages to Venezuela Televisión. Well, it's actually my independent producer because even the scene has been created by me because I'm a comprehensive producer. Those who were carrying wires and also knew about theory, so we were cameramen, then directors, then producers, and then I also have a diploma of the BBC. I will stop because I don't want to speak about something today. So here I conclude dossier. Remember, this is not a Telstra show. It's my own as an independent producer. And the phrases development and full development are duly registered. And this means that dossier is over. So we'll meet tomorrow, wherever you may be, on the other side of the screen, after she has taken another turn about the imaginary access. Director, the floor is all yours.